violent guy. Um, I, that is to say, I like to study violent processes. And, um, and so I'm going to talk today about um, um, some simulations that I've been doing of, um, of uh, volatile-rich um, magma columns. And um, this uh, picture has been um, uh, shown a lot this past week um, on account of the board meeting and stuff. And, it's, um, and, and I wanted to um, show it again because it's, it's, um, it's a picture not by a scientist, of course, but by an artist, John Kaufman, who um, got in touch with me some years ago and, and um, with, um, with, with nice pictures of violent geological processes. I went on my door of a meteor impact that I simulated some years ago. But, um, but I like this picture because, um, because of what's going on in here. Um, and you see these, these plumes sort of coming up and, and, um, and interacting with the, with the surrounding medium. I'm not sure how accurate everything there is, but, um, but as I'll point out, a lot of what we do um, in this field is, is, um, is as much art as it, as it is science. And here's some diagrams of various things that have been found in nature. I'm not going to say very much about them because I don't know a lot about them, but um, um, some of you in the audience are responsible for, for some of these. And, and the thing that I wanted to point out here is there's a lot of different morphologies that, um, that exist in systems that are powered by magma from underneath the earth. And, um, and likewise, if you do experiments, here are um, three by Anders Namulin and, and, and one by Oystein, um, Oystein Tau, um, where you also get lots of different morphologies in um, in um, in physical experiments, and um, and simulations that I that I did some years ago <coughs> with a, um, with um, just hot fluid coming up out of um, into a um, a semi brittle medium um, shows that you can get lots of different morphologies in, in simulations as well. Um, the the value of, of this is, is not in so much that you can get different morphologies, but in understanding how the mor those morphologies arise. And, um, and from experiments, this again is from, from Oystein's uh, master's project, um, you can construct a phase diagram where, for in, this, in this case, for example, you're varying the pressure of an, of an inlet fluid um, and, the, and the depth underneath, um, underneath where, that, where that pressure is released. And you get you know sort of different morpho morphologies, and, and and you can show pictures and and so forth. And likewise, um, uh, in simulations, you can construct a phase diagram. And this again is from work I did uh, about three years ago, where I varied pressure and I also varied injection velocity, and I got um, the, you know the, the sort of a similar um, differentiation between you know these V-shaped things and um, and and pipe or cone-shaped things. What I would really like to see, however. And, um, and I haven't found it so far. Perhaps one of you knows um, where I could find such thing. is a phase diagram from the field. Um, so if we could fill in this, and I don't know what the axes would be. Um, they'd probably be something like pressure at depth and, and, um, and um, you know, percent of volatile mixture or, or whatever. Then, um, then, then we could start making contact between what we do in the experiments and what we do in the simulations and what we do in the field to really understand um, how this pro process goes on. What's really key is to, um, is to try to understand what governs those different morphologies. In these cases that I showed before, at low pressure I get cone sheets, at high pressure I get, well, incipient sills sometimes, but a straight pipe with hardened walls. If I have um, a very high pressure and deeper origin, um, then I get a conical rather than a cylindrical pipe um, and, and kind of a mar feature at the top. And, but the real question is, um, you know, so given that we, that we can kind of, kind of understand in a, in a set of simulations what produces different morphologies, and we can kind of understand in a set of simulation, in a set of physical experiments what pro produces different morphologies, <laughs> how much does that really tell us about what, what goes on in nature? I mean, after all, um, if I... Um, if I stir some milk in a coffee cup, I get something that looks like a spiral galaxy, but I can't claim to understand a, a spiral galaxy on the basis of the milk in the coffee cup. Um, so similar morphologies can arise from very different physical processes, and, and, and so we really need to, um, to, uh, um, to touch base firmly between field work, experimental work, and, um, and simulation work to, to expand the physics of, um, of, um, of volcanoes. Uh, so that brings me back to that uh, picture that I showed at first. So these two representations, um, one is from a scientific document, um, the other is from this, um, uh, this artist, John Kaufman. Um, and 
they're both really arch, aren't they? Um, the, this one claims to be more scientific because everything is labeled. Um, and um, and um, you know, he claims to understand that, that um, you know, this, is, this is from um, Surtse, uh, it's a rather old paper, 1983. Everything is labeled, and, and you can sort of see what's, what um, what uh, uh, thinks is going on. This one's not labeled, but it's prettier, um, and um, and and in some respects, it really tells you what's going on as well. But it's you know, I mean, both of these are equally valid, in my opinion, um, and um, and and so the question of you know how our science proceeds, um, you know, via visualization, via um, experimentation, via simulation, and so forth, is in my view, at least as much art as it is science. Um, so I want to talk first in general um, about what happens when a fluid penetrates into a, um, a resistive medium. So you could imagine driving forces of different natures, you know, an overpressure at the bottom, simply buoyancy, um, a mechanical piston coming down from below. And then, the re and then this medium um, resists the, the, the penetration of this fluid. But um, but it yields in some fashion as well, and it yields either through through plastic flow, through brittle failure, through cracking. Um, maybe the penetrating fluid is hot enough to melt the surrounding, and and um, and so you you start to get some viscous flow around it. Um, but in all cases, I mean, just looking at this picture, you you have to realize that that some general um, physical principles will apply. So there is there is always a uh, let me see if this works. There is always a um, a working surface um, right there at the head where the where the um, where the uh, fluid is advancing into the medium, and <clears throat> at that working surface, um, the penetrating fluid loses energy. Um, if it if it uh, penetrates by melting the surrounding medium, then it loses energy and, and it cools off. It, it needs to descend. If, it, um, if it's simply ram pressure, likewise it loses kinetic energy, so it, so it, um, so, um, uh, it, so it needs to descend again. In all cases, the, um, the, the work of penetrating the resistive medium results in the fluids losing energy. Um, and this means that the speed of the head advance is necessarily slower than the speed with which material is delivered to the working surface from below. Um, that, in turn, implies um, that there's always going to be a return flow. Um, so the return flow, um, as I pictured it here, will go around, around the sides. It need not necessarily go around the sides. It could go down the, um, the middle of the column. But, um, but I think the most general case, or the most typical case, is where, where it goes around the side. <clears throat> um, and so that has some implications. And, um, and this is clearly seen in, in, in simulations where um, you know, you plot the plot the um, uh, velocity vectors at at um, um, at a, you know, some fraction of the cells in in, in the in the uh, um, in the simulation volume, and, and you can see the this this is not terribly useful. I can point it up here. Stick. It's over here. In the I'm tethered, so I can't. <laughs> so, um, so, so you have this central, very vigorous flow coming up here, and it slows down. Um, it doesn't it, in this in this view. It doesn't quite um, reach stagnation here. The head is still advancing, and you see this return flow coming down um, along the sides. And, and that return flow has implications on what it does to the structure of the of the medium in which it's advancing into. So we're talking about volcanoes here. So um, th that would have implications on the ablation of, of, um, of structures that might um, pre-exist in the, in the conduit wall. Um, it could enhance the, the fragmentation through shear and grinding of the country rock. Um, and, it could, and, and it also influences the way the external medium, the external um, uh, material is entrained into the column. In particular, um, you might wonder what happens um, down here at this neck where, this, um, where, where the return flow um, is, um, is forced back down to join the, um, um, the central column flow. So the, so the real question is what, what happens there at the neck? So, um, so I'm going to um, take you slowly through, um, through some uh, uh, 
through a simulation where um, where I'm looking at a, at, um, at at a moving window here, just following the plume head, um, and we'll watch what happens here at um, at the neck. Um, Okay, that's a little bit further on. Um, the, the, the plume the plume grows as, as it um, as it goes up. Um, a little bit further on, do you see what's happening? A little further on. <clears throat> now it should um, it should become apparent that the the entrainment of the external medium is principally happening where um, where the thing next off, and it becomes clear if I take away all of the uh, velocity vectors. You see, the, um, the the return flow results in a pinching of the conduit wall at this at, at this point, and an entrainment of the external medium, which in this case forms a cylindrical annulus um, proceeding up um, through the middle of the plume around that central flow. Um, now you've got um, the, uh, this, this strong central flow coming up here, you've got a return flow coming down along the side of, of the column, and so you've got um, a strong velocity gradient um, between the sides and, and the center, um, so, um, so you're, um, the medium in between then is subject to a two stream or Helmut, Helvin, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, um, and, that, um, and so you start to get ripples in this um, in this entrained material, um, which um, which then <coughs> it, 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 um, it's clear that you start to get mixing between the entrained fluid from the entrained material from the from the external medium and the and the and the driving fluid coming in. There's something else going on in this picture, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, um, and that's um, what's happening near the head of the plume. Um, you see there's a color gradient um, up here, but, I'll, uh, but I'll, I'll save that for a few slides later from now. Um, if we look at the trajectories of tracer particles that initially start out in the external medium, um, we see that, that they um, undergo these oscillations um, uh, partly because of the return flow um, in, the, in the plume itself and also because of, of being swept up in, in the, uh, in the um, in, in the driving fluid and training in, in the driving fluid. So um, I'll run you now through a movie of, of the particular simulation that I'm, um, that, that I'm um, focusing on here. I've done, I've done a bunch of these, but I'm, I'm just going to show you um, this one in the first instance, and then I'll show you a couple more later on. Um, what I've done here is, um, is put in a magma column, um, which I've created a, a mixture of 98% basalt and 2% water by mass. I understand that, that the um, more typical values are 2% water by volume, so um, so this may be um, you know three to five times heavy um, in terms of its volatile content. <clears throat> um, and I made it hot, 1500 degrees, degrees Kelvin or about 1200 uh, Celsius. And, um, and the overpressure is about 20% the pressure at the base of the column. And I uh, put that under um, 3.2 kilometers of basalt and, and, um, and a few hundred meters of ice. I'm thinking naturally about Katla, um, and, uh, which uh, uh, and some people are worried might, um, might go any time. <coughs> um, but, um, uh, but this is the simulation that, I, that I've been talking about. So the, um, the evolution of the plume starts um, at slow at first and, um, and, and relatively homogeneous. <clears throat> and um, it, starts to, it starts to pinch off here. You see an entrainment of the, of the medium, and that goes very quickly. And then, um, and then what happens later on is, um, uh, is what I really want to focus on, and that's, and that's the fact that this mixture of 98% water, 98% um, basalt and 2% water results in a separation um, of these two components, with the volatile component separating out and, and effectively um, driving the mechanics of the eruption. So, so this this um, color gradient here is is basically a um, a, uh, a sign of the fact that the that the, that the supercritical water has um, has begun at this point to separate out from the from the basalt, um, and and you see this entrainment of of the country rock um, suffering this instability. Um, it, um, it becomes um, further separated, <clears throat> get more mix, mixing down here, um, and as it goes on, you start to, um, to see another, um, another necking of this plume, um, separate from this, uh, this original necking which we saw, um, and then this neck closes off and, um, and actually separates 
the um, the rapidly expanding water vapor. It's now it's it has passed from supercritical phase into vapor phase because the, pre because the pressure is low enough uh, to allow it to do so, um, and um, and then it very rapidly expands, and and that expansion causes a further necking down of this, um, further um, also um, enhancing the separation of the of the two components of the uh, um, of the erupting column. Um, and then um, eventually this uh, expanding vapor bubble breaks through the crust below the ice. Um, this second neck enhances the entrainment. We see more material being, being um, uh, sucked up into this, into this bubble. And most importantly of all, you see the incipient development here of a Delaval nozzle. Um, now, Delaval nozzle, um, I've talked about this before, is, um, it, it is what makes a jet engine work. Um, it's basically a, um, a funneling off between um, a high pressure medium and a very low pressure medium in such a way that you produce supersonic flow. Um, so, um, so this Delaval nozzle is, is, um, is producing supersonic flow here, effectively sucking um, the, um, the magma material upwards in a supersonic jet. And, um, and in, in Oystein's talk the other day, he showed um, the shocks coming out of Ayaf Yatlayotl. We've seen shocks, shocks from, from other volcanoes as well, and you can see them clear, very clearly in, in, uh, in films of geysers and so forth. Um, but um, uh, the essential feature there is this, is this spontaneous formation of a Delaval nozzle, which, um, um, which uh, um, induces a supersonic flow. To prove that the flow is supersonic, um, you only have to look for um, the, uh, mock, the, the uh, existence of shocks and mock disks, or shock diamonds. Can everybody see that? If not, I'll, um, or even if you can, <laughs> this program did here, I will um, outline them here in these dotted yellow lines. Um, there's three of them. Um, and they're clearly visible here. There are others down here which are, which are less clearly visible. Um, it's clearly a, um, a very strongly supersonic, supersonic flow <coughs> that's, um, that's coming out of, the, of that. Um, so here's, here's the De Laval nozzle, the narrowest point in the, um, in the flow where, the, where, where you get the first shock occurring, and that's, and that's where the, the flow transitions from subsonic to supersonic. And, um, and it turns out that the De Laval nozzle um, moves with time, and, and sometimes the, the uh, um, some, in this case it just goes up, but, but sometimes you can see it go, go down as well, causing the flow to pulse. So I'll do a, um, a short um, segment of the movie <clears throat> um, just looking at, um, at, at Breakout, um, where um, it, at this point you still have a fairly homogeneous mixture of, <clears throat> of, um, of magma and water. Um, soon after this, this point, it becomes it, um, the, the supercritical water separates out, um, becomes vaporized when when it reaches about this point, um, and then um, and then once it punches through, um, you have this very hot, very fast material um, uh, pushing through the ice, and um, and and the ice melts, becomes water. The water wants to come in, but explosive vaporization of that melt of that melt water. Um, keeps the channel open um, for as long as uh, for as long as this uh, um, as the pressure source exists down here. And uh, and I should say I um, um, I have a constant source of pressure at at the very bottom, so I, so I don't allow it to uh, to deplete. But that's what um, that's what keeps the behavior of the ice not to it. it. Looks like the ice is very. It becomes very it becomes very liquid very quickly. Um, it, yeah, it's, um, uh, is that reasonable? There's this rate of deformation fragment? I don't know the answer to that question. I, um, I, I, suspect, um, I, I suspect it's not completely reasonable, and, and, um, and I probably need to, uh, to fix the material properties of the ice um, uh, to, um, to keep it solid a little bit longer, or, or, or to make it crust, or whatever. But, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah. Just a follow, quick follow-up since we spoke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so also with the material properties of the, uh, of the rocks there, of the basalts, mm -hmm. is that uh, homogeneous yeah. more or less? Or um, do you, do you yes. Or for uh, fracturing or layering or anything like that? In this that? case, it's, it's homogeneous. I have done cases where, where I have layered them and, and, um, and put weak zones in. Um, but um, uh, 
But it, you know, the, the, the more things you do, the harder it is to understand. <laughs> of course, so I've always done I mean, simple. Is, but is, mm -hmm. it, is that the first order effect, basically, with the layering of factoring, or is it just like uh, uh, a minor effect uh, compared to, let's say, the shape of the uh, right. plumes that you have and, and the physics that you observe? Okay, talk about there is um, there is a first order effect, and I'll and I'll and I'll show it later on. Um, and um, and and I'm not quite at the point where I really understand. Um, you know, I I have simulations that behave one way. I have simulations that behave in a dramatically different way. Um, there are differences, you know, certainly differences in the in in the way I've set them up. You know, in terms of the input parameters and so forth. But um, but what I what I um, have been working on for the last year or so is trying to bridge that gap and trying to understand um, exactly where where the um, where the different um, uh, morphologies um, enter in um, but um, uh, but in this talk I just want to focus on, um, on on understanding this one fairly well I should say the the, the basalt is uh, the the material properties that I put in for the basalt are fairly soft and I've done that um, for the reason of allowing the the computation to proceed um, in a um, within a week or something, you know. So, um, uh, so, so that's that's part of the art of um, of doing this rather than that. So, but one thing one thing that one can uh, talk about is where um, is where material comes from and where it goes, um, and um, and I can do that by by putting tracers tracer particles um, um, in the in particular regions of, of the um, of the problem, and, and so these are tracer particles that that um, start out initially within the ma magma mixture, and virtually all of them are are um, are ejected. Um, many of them on ballistic um, trajectories, and some of them um, you know on these more more sort of turbulent trajectories, which uh, um, suggest that they are joining the uh, uh, the surge flow um, across the top of the uh, across the top of the water. Um, if um, if I look at tracers that are placed initially within the within the country rock, um, they're colored. The blue ones are 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 from sort of this level and above. The um, brown ones from from this level and above. The green ones um, within the, within this range and the pink ones within this range. Um, the uh, um, those from the upper layers are all ejected ballistically. Those from um, intermediate layers um, generally form part of the surge surge deposit surge uh, uh, the surge flow. And um, and those from very deep, um, although they they move around a lot, um, they don't leave the leave the uh, um, uh, leave this this uh, uh, leave the conduit volume um, at least not during the the um, time scale of the simulation that I've done here. Um, another way of of, um, of looking at the tracers is to um, is to uh, plot their their vertical positions on um, against time. And um, and here um, the, the interesting thing about this is is, is if you see the the conduit wall tracers being pushed um, in advance of the of the erupting column, which is which is indicated in red here, um, and also pulled um, from behind the erupting column as um, as as the column proceeds upwards. Um, a little bit closer, you can you can also see the. Um, the back, the up and down motion of, of particles within the um, the eruptive column, uh, reflecting the uh, uh, the return flow that I talked about earlier, and then the, this, this push um, upward, and then um, when the pull um, uh, uh, from below it as as part of the, the entrainment of the country rock. Right. So um, so then. Um, then I'll talk briefly about um, about these other regimes that I've that I've looked at. So this this um, um, simulation is entirely in the ductile re regime. The, um, the the fluid that um, the uh, country rock that surrounds it is a is a plastic fluid. Um, um, so it starts out with uh, you know it has a yield strength which is which is set fairly low, um, and um, and then its its flow. In the external medium, it's set by by its um, by its shear modulus, and that effectively its viscosity. Um, and so, the penetration of this of this um, uh, of this driving fluid um, into the into the resistive fluid is entirely um, is entirely ductile, is entirely um, uh, a process of um, of plastic deformation. Um, these older runs that I had done before um, were um, in a medium which had um, a um, a higher um, 
yield, um, higher yield strength um, and lower um, tensile strength, so, so that they tend to fail brittlely. And, um, and so you can see cracks developing in the upper surface and so on. These were, these were um, um, runs that I did um, at fairly low resolution and, and, um, and largely exploratory. And, um, and so the, the, um, the aim now is to, is to proceed from, from these high resolution runs um, back into this regime to, uh, um, to see if we can um, uh, understand the, the difference between, um, between these and, and these and get something like a, like a phase diagram. The, um, the phase, a phase diagram that I would produce with these would all, would all basically look um, like you know these these pipe structures or cone structures and so forth. Um, in in this case, um, you know I can clearly get some of these uh, these uh, um, V-shaped cone shape cone shape types uh, or sills or whatever. Um, uh, so I'm working on on, on trying to expand uh, to extend the, uh, this type of, of simulation back into the re this regime to uh, to see um, what we can do there. And I'm, um, and um, it's at the moment it's still crude, but I'm making some progress. Um, and, um, and so here's one with, um, with high driving pressure, and you can see the development of, of the incipient development of, of, these, of these cone sheets and, and sills as it comes up, and then, and then fragmentation um, as it goes on. And, I, and, um, and I'm hoping that, um, that eventually we'll be able to compare these you know, more or less directly with, uh, with the experiments that um, Weistein has done. Um, and, um, and then the same thing, but with, um, with low driving pressure produces instead. Um, these cone sheets, um, and um, and often um, one of them reaches the surface first. I should also say that uh, that these simulations are um, in in two uh, D Cartesian grid, whereas the the, the ones with the, with the erupting column are in um, a cylindrical grid. So um, in, uh, so uh, the, <clears throat> um, I'm only able to do two D simulations with the resources I have. Um, and, um, and and so you have to impose some degree of symmetry um, there, and, and um, th this one allows as um, asymmetries in the in the left right direction to occur, um, which um, which is an interesting thing for the cone sheets. So um, yeah, that's basically my talk. Um, I've, you know, doing these simulations to help aid understanding of of, um, of how eruptive processes occur, um, and the the uh, main thing that I want to Two main things I want to point out are the um, existence of this return flow, which um, which uh, would clearly um, um, affect the interpretation of geological deposits left behind um, after, um, when when one looks at, at fossil pipes at, after eruptions or or, or whatever, and um, and secondly that um, that, that uh, the volatile component. Um, of the of the magma column is, is really what drives the eruption process and, and, and what makes everything go. Um, what also occurred um, to me, you know, while looking at this, is, is that you get fragmentation not only um, when when the column bursts through the surface or or in other near surface uh, um, effects, but um, but also that you that you might um, have fragmentation occurring very deep within the column. Um, in the interaction between, um, between the return flow and the um, and, and the uh, column walls, um, and that um, and that this right, this ablation of the, of the of the country rock um, by the return flow and the subsequent retain, entrainment of the country rock into the um, into the central flow um, can produce that fragmentation, but um, um, but we can't uh, resolve um, fragmentation the from fragmentation process itself. Down there, um, with the, um, with that's the, probably where the counter rock is actually mixed into the magmatic system. Where yeah. This, uh, counter right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, yeah, this um, work on the brittle, brittle regime is still in progress. I've got runs going right now, but they take a long time. So I um, was hoping to be able to report on them, but um, um, but that'll have to um, be in the spring. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. A short talk. Yeah.